All right, here we go. Today we're going to be looking at QAnon. QAnon and how it is seen as infiltrating the the church and in particular how it's a, a infiltrating the churches here in America. And I know this is having an effect in Australia and other places, but I do want to just for us to focus in on what's happening here in America. For those of you who don't perhaps have never heard of QAnon, let me tell you just briefly what that is. Q is the name of an individual who, I think it was about 2017, started posting stuff on a uh, board called 4chan. It's 4 and then C-H-A-N, 4chan. And then he also was publishing, he, and the only reason I'm using the suffix he, um, I mean the pronoun he, is because that is how his followers uh, refer to him as a male. But no one knows though. It could be a female. But that's kind of the accepted is calling it 4chan, is seeing this person as a female, I mean, uh, as a male. And so, and then Q, I discovered yesterday, actually can refer to a particular security clearance that uh, you can get through the, I think, federal government or Department of Defense, things like that. So some people think that this individual is a um, a high-ranking official in the government. So that's Q. And what Q does is he he posts uh, items, not only on 4chan, but he does it on 8chan. And I think there's a 6chan. He he posts on Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T-T, another board that people use. So this stuff is out there. And a lot of it comes across as very cryptic, which leaves plenty of room for people to apply different interpretations to Q's drops. And that's what they're called, is when he puts something out on the internet, it's called a drop. And so people have been following him. And how this really got it started was Pizzagate. And Pizzagate was the idea that there is a deep state within our nation. And their primary objective is to um, uh, uh, child... Um, uh, what's the word left? Um, abuse, abuse and abduction. Yes, abuse and abduction. Thank you. Can child abuse. Drink, and he also drinks the blood of children. Yes, child abuse and abduction. And it was all supposed to be coming from this one pizza place in Washington. And it got to the point where actually an individual uh, who was seen by many as outstanding, he was a churchgoer. He went to Pizza Gate. He went to this pizza place with his gun and was committed to freeing all these young children. And he, the the rumor was that they were being kept down in the basement. Well, this pizza place had no basement. Uh, he ended up getting arrested and said he was misled. He was misunderstood. However, he continues to be a part of QAnon. And the, the Anon comes from anonymous. So Q is the designation that this person uses and hints to the possibility of some kind of security clearance. And Anon is the anonymous part of it. So individuals have started and continue to take the things that this person is dropping out on the boards and then interpreting them. And that's where a lot of these conspiracy theories are coming about. For example, uh, from once the uh, Trump became president in 2016, they believe that Trump was going to be the savior, that there's this deep state movement taking place in America. And one of the main proponents of this are the Clintons. And then from there, it just anyone that kind of crosses Q or that group as possibility. And the Democrats are a big part of that also. So this individual, they see Trump as being the main person who is going to free us from this deep state and bring in a, 
a kind of an apocalyptic movement because while QAnon and its followers see this deep state, they also see it as being trying to have a new world order. And that's what Trump is fighting. Trump is actively fighting that. That's why from the very beginning, they believe that he was attacked, all these conspiracies against him as far as Russia and all these things. And they're always watching Trump for little indications that he is communicating to them. So one time, even just Trump somehow used his finger in a circular motion, and they read that, interpreted that in a particular way. There was another time where Trump said something about, um, you know, the, you need to watch, something is coming. And again, they took that and ran with it. So there's a lot that's going on right now with regards to QAnon. Now, here's thing, where... I'm sorry, Tony. That's go go ahead. You have to listen to the, when somebody says the number 17, and then you also need to listen to that because after that's going to come a drop. And Trump could be making a drop or anybody else that are, are resisting cabal. And the cabal actually is worldwide in a lot of people's minds. And it's just, and it's a deep, deep state as part of it. But in addition to the circle, and they've got other loop, loop signals that they use, also listen for the word 17. Because Q is the 17th letter of the alphabet. the alphabet. Ah, I didn't know that. Very interesting. Well, what's happening is now QAnon is attracting more and more Christians. And in this last week's uh, podcast, I talked about how there are churches and ministers, especially within the evangelical side of things, who are seeing an influx of these conspiracy theories on their members' social media uh, platforms, as well as in conversations that they are overhearing at church. And so this is creating a very interesting dynamic within churches. And now the majority of ministers are against this that I read about. However, here's where it gets <laughs> fascinating. They have started a movement called Ecclesia. And in Greek, Ecclesia is often interpreted as the church. But in its literal, it's a compound word. Ek is a, a Greek preposition, which means out of or from. And the root of that noun Ecclesia uh, comes from the Greek kaleo, which means to call out. So some people see the church, this ecclesia, as those who are being called out from. And one of the things that they're really pushing now is home churches. And you can get training on how to become a home church that not only teaches the Bible, but also teaches Q. Apparently, there are 10 videos out there on YouTube that kind of give you a, um, a, encapsulate what Q is all about and what this movement is. And they will use those in these home churches. So it's a movement that's really taken off. And it's still small, but yesterday I went to one of the main ministers, and this I found fascinating. He put up a YouTube, and you think our church services sometimes are long, right? But sometimes we go an, even an hour. We try to go about 50. Um, this guy was going two hours. And the first hour was talking about Bible, and the second hour was talking about and interpreting the drops from Q. And they were linking these two together. So the reading of the Bible and Q were brought together. One last one is QAnon encourages their members to ignore mainstream media, including Fox News. So you don't even listen to Fox News because all of it is fake news. And if you want to find the truth, the truth comes from Q. So this is starting to infiltrate Christian churches. So at its core, you got this home church movement, 
But that isn't affecting the majority of evangelicals. But what's affecting the majority of evangelicals is these conspiracy theories. So with that background, I want to open it up to a question that I've been thinking about all week. What is it about Christianity in particular that makes it recept, uh, receptible or receptive to conspiracy theories such as QAnon? What is it about Christianity that makes it receptive to that from your perspective? Well, I go two ways, I think, Tony, if I may. Okay. The first one that came to my mind is, is I would want to dig further in terms into what population of Christians are paying attention to this, first of all. And I'm afraid that we'll probably end up seeing a political relationship also to that. I don't know that for sure. But that's the first thing I would ask myself of who who are these people that are following that direction? What was the position they had in terms of the way they look at the world in the first place? That's the first thought that I had. Second thought that I had was, and Nancy just bumped me with it, and that was the fact that there's a lot of mystery in Christianity, and you have to believe a lot of things in, this, in, in Christianity that you can't grab your hands on. And, you know, and so you could, be, you could succumb to that just because that's the nature of, of where you ended up believing. And so I think there is a tendency to go that way. So I would want to peel the onion back a little bit further, find out which one of those it is. I, I can see right wing extremists and Christian and some Christian theology. And the best example lately is how you can do that and still be a sinner is follow up. But I don't want to say any more about that. But anyhow, so there's both of those, I think, that, that are operative from my point of view. I don't know which one it is at this point. Well, I, let's focus more on the because I think you're right, Dan, in the sense that I'm not sure either which one it tends to lean more strongly toward. But let's intentionally focus on the, the Christian side of it. And, and your comment, Dan, is that Christianity encourages us to accept mysteries, to accept... Um, again, please understand that my role as moderator, <laughs> I'm qualifying, my role as moderator is not to tell you what I think, what I believe, but it's to... Uh, at times play the devil's advocate to spur the conversation. So how would you respond to the, the, the charge that Christians from for the last 2,000 years have been founded on conspiracy theories? That's a stretch, Tony. I, I didn't say conspiracy theories. I said mystery. Mystery, I know. But what? But, but, why, yeah. why would we call what we QAnon is doing as conspiracy theories and then what the Christian church has done, why do we call it mystery? Why, I, what makes a conspiracy theory versus faith and a mystery? Well, be, because for me, that one, the uncertain, the, 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 the connecting between the two, between conspiracy and mystery, is the unknown. At some point, you have to believe the unknown to belong. And, and, and I think that's true. And I, I just, you know, so if you want to belong somewhere, you accept the unknown. If you want to belong to something that's going on in society, and QAnon comes forth and gives you some potential plausible answers that make you feel good, boom, there I am. Okay, and I, I'm gonna. Okay, I'm gonna extend even further out. Uh, let's go to the Immaculate um, Mary, the Virgin Mary, and the Immaculate Conception, and that she is now in heaven, and she intercedes for us. And this is a huge part of people's life. There's a great deal of meaning for them in believing that Mary is doing this for them. Is that a conspiracy theory or is that a mystery? Yeah, I think the difference though is that with QAnon, QAnon is not asking you to believe in mysteries. Like, like the mysteries in Christianity are things with, which the church has said have happened in history that are sui generis events, right? So there's, there are the incarnation, 
uh, the resurrection, these things are, are things the church has claimed happened in history, but have no precedent and are kind of in a unique class all their own. QAnon's not asking you to believe in mysteries. It's just asking you to believe that there are people that are drinking children's blood and, you know, running pedophile rings out of a pizza shop. So it's not, it's, it's actually, it requires like less faith, less faith in something supernatural or mysterious. It, it, I mean, it maybe is more faith in things that are probably outlandish and preposterous. I mean, first off, they, they say Tom Hanks is involved in this stuff. Come on, everybody knows Tom Hanks is a good guy. I mean, right. there's no way he's involved in anything like that. I mean, that there's takes no a way. lot of suspension, disbelief, uh, belief, disbelief to believe Tom Hanks would be involved in it. So I just think that's a different thing. I mean, it's, it's not, they're not asking you to believe in like religious sui generis truths. They're just asking you to believe in things that you could be an atheist and believe in, in the QAnon stuff. I, again, maybe I'm, I'm missing it, but I don't see... A we distinct, cannot open those right now. I, I don't see a distinction between... Right because I bought them for someone else. Um, I don't see a distinction between, at this point, what you just said and what the church promotes. For example, um, you have the Virgin Mary, and she was born sinless so that she could carry God. I... I how is that not a conspiracy theory versus there's children in this basement that are being abused? How, how are they any different from each other? Doesn't, in fact, for me, just because one takes more faith, does that make it less of a, a conspiracy theory? Um, Karen and then Gary. In this Q anon, is it do do they bring God together with them? The the movement as a whole, no. Okay. However, a branch is starting to develop and it yeah, is okay. growing. Okay. That's what I thought you said. Right, like and that. I'm right. wondering. Well, I'm wondering. You know, for all the unchurched, if we want to call them, or those who don't want anything to do with, with organized religion, um, this could be another option. And yes, yes. I would think, I would think that it might, that there's people out there that might believe that God, Jesus, creation whatever you want to call it is a conspiracy theory um a far-fetched idea so to do this q anon may not seem that crazy well i on the scale uh, on the scale of youtube right youtube if you have you know, 5,000 views, you're seen as just kind of blah. <laughs> this, uh, this minister, and it's, he's a, a pastor, and he's working with another individual. They've started this group, and they put out YouTube once a week. They're getting over 1,000 views. In the context of Church of the Beatitudes, we're not even hitting 200 yet on YouTube. And we're probably been operating about the same amount of time. Wow. Um, wow. Julie and Gary, I mean, Gary. I, um, I'm, I'm reminded of, of how we all, uh, or most of us want to be uh, insiders. We want the special deal. We want the special discount. We want to know before other people. Um, and we love kibitzing about this stuff. This is why ESPN is so popular, right? You've got the game, but the game's not enough. We want to talk about what's going on beyond the, beyond the game and behind the game and what's happening in the league. And we want that insider uh, access. And, that's, and that goes beyond sports. That goes to, I read a book recently by um, a professor at a university in Florida called Hit Lit, H-I-T-L-I-T. 
He analyzed the 12 most popular novels of the 20th century and found out how they're all very, very similar. And one of the, one of the reasons is um, the idea of the secret society. So like Dan Brown books or The Godfather or, or even Hunt for Red October, these secret niche societies, these, the, the, our glimpse into the land of the elite and what's really going on. And actually something you said during your podcast this past week about how uh, there's a tremendous amount of overlap between philosophy and religion and even and professional wrestling because fans of professional wrestling have the spectacle in front of them, but they kind of know that's not really the deal. They want to talk about what's going on behind the spectacle and what's happening with the lives of the various competitors and with the money in the league and so on and so on. I think there's a tremendous amount of appeal, just human appeal to something like QAnon because, okay, friends, here's what's really happening behind what you see in the headlines, behind what you see in the news. And don't you want to be in the know? Don't you want to be one of the informed ones? Um, I, I, you know, I'm kind of reminded like 30, 40 years ago when everyone was talking about, well, probably even longer, remember like the 15th, 16th century French uh, astrologer, Nostradamus, right? There were all kinds of TV shows about Nostradamus and how his predictions 400 years ago were going to tell us what's happening right now. Again, this insider access. And I, I feel like there's also a, there's a lot of bad stuff going on, right? I mean, not even just the plague, but the world as a whole is kind of messed up. And people like the solace or the comfort that comes from some kind of uh, reassurance from the knowledge of, hey, here's what's really going on. This will, give, this will put you in a better position amid all the tumultuous garbage that we're dealing with. I think, I think there's something to that. Um, but obviously that's speculation. I'll have to check my inside sources and see what they say. <laughs> And, and again, I just think about what's happening right now. Going back off of what Gary just said, QAnon believes that it is not an accident that Trump is our president. Evangelicals are saying that it is not an accident that Trump is our pres president. How is one any different than the other? And then if you look at Christianity has had a, a tendency to do what Gary just described, and that is look at current events, look at the Bible, especially the books of Revelation and Daniel, and use those as a means of saying and interpreting what's really going on. So I'm going to go back to what Gary was just saying. It's, it's a matter of just saying, look, what's really going on, we have the inside information that the majority of other people don't have. Dan. I agree with Gary. I, I think, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, though, too. I think it's, you have to decide what kind of Christian is falling for this. There are some Christians um, that see their, their Christianity as a, a way of life and a value system that explains who, why and who they, who they are and why they live. Then you get another element that wants to win, and they want to have the right answer. And so those are the people that I have, Christians, who I have difficulty. I personally have much difficulty with them. But they are also then going to be very, very susceptible to having somebody come in and give them the answer about the world affairs. As Gary said, the world is messed up. I believe in that. And we're looking, you know, periodically, we, we look for somebody, we hope for some kind of leader that's going to make this all gives some sense to us. So if somebody comes forward and said, we know there's a cabal operating and it's here it is. And you know, and and you know, the way this is now set up, that you know, Trump is the person that they use the word savior that's gonna get us out of this. And and uh, if there are some people, and I happen to believe it's the case, and you got some very um um which I say um uh, uh conservative uh structure of Christianity that have the answers, then I think the, that they're compatible. So I think it's a combination, but a great deal to do with what Gary says about it is indeed looking for answers. And, 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 and a lot of people like to win. They like to win, so they want the answers. That goes back to, I'm on the other side. I know what's going on. I'm just trying to help you get out of it. You know, just okay. like, and it's, you, can, you, you can use it with a, I'm gonna go crazy here, but you can use, you can use that rationale for abortion. You can use that rationale for, the afterlife, whatever. 
Scott. <clears throat> yeah, I think that what's interesting is that you look at the, cons- the thing in the history of Christianity that's most been affiliated with conspiracy theory ideas. It's Gnosticism, right? It's, Christianity has generally been a very public faith, very supportive of the body, very supportive of human suffering and alleviating it. And Gnostics come along and say, no, no, really, there's this secret knowledge that you have to have. And the body's not really good. And there's this other world that we can initiate into the secret knowledge to get there. And I think a lot of the kind of um, Christianity that is affiliated or or tends to find an affinity with QAnon is kind of a modern day Gnosticism, right? It kind of, it it devalues the body. It, 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 it's not a Christianity that seeks to alleviate human suffering and takes the incarnation seriously. It's a Christianity that's sort of, Hey, like, yeah, we got the secret codes over here to interpret the book of revelation and Daniel. And it tends to be, again, like it has so much of this affinity for this classical heresy. Right. And I think that it's the Gnostic kind of impulse that, that draws the QAnon kind of thing. Cause they're both this sort of secret knowledge uh, where once you have the secret knowledge, you're the insider where historically Christianity has been public knowledge. It's not a secret. You know, there's the proclamation that something unique happened. And it's uh, changed the world. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to Amy, but Scott, just real quick. Um, and then Craig, but Scott, I want you to answer after Amy and Craig. So keep this in mind. Um, and I'm pointing at you on the screen. I don't know why, <laughs> but <laughs> But Jesus talked a lot in mystery. He talked in parables. He kept saying, you know, for he who has ears, let him hear. And then he was asked, why do you speak in parables? And he said, well, some people aren't ready to hear this. I mean, Jesus was very much into this whole idea of mystery and how he said. And then on top of that, add Revelation and Daniel and these apocalyptic type of literature. Very much mysterious. The meaning is below the surface. So just to kind of come back at you, but Scott, hold on, because I'm going to come back once you uh, come up with your answer. So Amy and then Craig. You're muted, Amy. There you go. Oh, you're muted again. Gotcha. Okay. I don't want to steal Scott's answer, but... um, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to forget what you just said. Okay. What I was going to say too, is that I think it actually appeals to a fear that a lot of humans have about what's wrong. Like we have a sense that there's something wrong and we want to know why. And a lot of religion is about trying to figure out why is there suffering and making sense of life that way. And and some some Christians, perhaps a lot of a lot of world religions, um, point to the world as getting worse rather than better. So there's a, an added sense of worry built on that, and there's a need to find relief from that worry and a need to find an answer for the fear that we have for why it, you know why is there suffering? Is God really against us? And and or for us and so on and so forth so the desire to find an answer for fear and an answer for worry can lead well-meaning and and well-educated christians even down paths of conspiracy theories to try to to try to figure out what's really going on here so that so that i don't don't have to feel quite so afraid i at least know what's going on Exactly. Um, yes. And, and I think Amy going, building on that is the hope within the Old Testament and in the New Testament was very much a sense of, of this inbreaking from God to make everything right again. And this inbreaking was seen as a mystery. And the timing of it is a mystery. And people have continued to make efforts to di- discover when that might happen because that's ultimately what will bring um, that's what people's hope is is they will find this and i think QAnon is doing the same thing they're looking at the situation as you described it and they're going wow how in the world are we ever going to get out of this and they've come up with a, something that will give them hope and it's a kind of a, a salvation a deliverance 
Craig. Yes, uh, you kind of stole my thunder too. I was going to talk. You know, Christianity has always been very apocalyptic. I mean, the Essenes during Christ's time, you know, were out in the desert waiting for the, the second coming. And so this is nothing new. And throughout history, there's always been a, apocalyptic discussions. You know, today we have the dispensationalists. You ever, I went, I went to a Bible study with the dispensationalist pastor, and, and it was all about looking for the signs. There's a sign here, Revelation, sign in Daniel, and pointing towards the next thousand years in the reign of Christ. And so I, I think when you have this kind of language going on constantly, and, and Amy called it, and you get a society that's full of fear, then they're ripe for paranoia. <laughs> you know, they just are. As this fear leads to wanting security, and like it was said before, having the inside information makes you feel secure. But the core problem is fear. And this is nothing new. This has taken place throughout the history of Christianity. There's nothing new. We're making a big deal about it now because it's happening now. But if you you know, know anything about the history of Christianity, this has always taken place, you know? And there's always signs, and Christ talked about it, and Paul talked about it. There's signs and, and country against country, there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be false false prophets and false messiahs, and you got to have the right sign, you know, and all of it is one thing, it's the opposite of faith. Scott. That's it. Okay, I'm working on my answer. You still so working think, on it? No, I got it. Um, okay. I think a couple of things. I think the fact that Jesus taught in parables doesn't mean that the early church was a secret society in the sense of, you notice, you don't find any parables in the book of Acts. You don't find parables in the letters of Paul. You don't how find... About, how about the Gospel of John? Well, I'm saying, like, th these are... And the, that these was probably are, one of the last ones written. Right, you don't, you don't find parables in the Gospel of John very often, right? I mean, so, so this is something where I think the early church, whatever we make of Jesus' parables, and there's lots of reasons Jesus probably taught in parables, but the early church didn't conceive things in parables they you know you look at peter's early sermons the sermons in the book of acts this thing happened for the reconciliation of the world like he did this you know so sins could be forgiven and the other thing i i think about like a book of, like revelation i don't think that is the secret as we think in the sense of i remember teaching undergrads something about interpretation and i put up a, a slide of a bald eagle boxing a bear and i asked them what does this mean and they were all millennials None of them knew what it meant, not one. Whereas, you know, if you had grown up in the Cold War, everyone knew, right? It, oh, this is just the Cold War. And so I think that, like, it, that took a couple years for that symbol to be lost. So I'm thinking when people were reading the book of Revelation, it was not as lost on them, the symbols and the characters, as it, as, as it is on us. I mean, they would know who the players are. Okay, this is Rome. Okay, this is, you know, these are the sort of... So I think that what we do with the book of Revelation is like what my undergrad millennials would do like with a bald eagle boxing a, a, a bear. Like, okay, we have to make up some meaning for it because we don't know. There's really a pretty simple, straightforward meaning to it, right? It's just been lost. And I think that's the way we read apocalyptic literature. So I don't think that stuff is meant to be secret society stuff as much as it's sort of like political cartoon stuff. Gary. Um, I was I was just going to um, follow up what Craig said that yeah this has happened before and it's in to some degree there's nothing new about it but at the same time um, just in life in general for societies as a whole whether we're speaking about Christian society or or uh, civilization um, there there are moments of crisis and and we have to move forward through those moments of crisis but while you're in the midst of them it causes tremendous amount of panic and in the midst of that panic there are people who uh, are faced with questioning their their views of the world and and a gut reaction is they want confirmation that their way of seeing things is correct and that the, the, we can somehow go back to the way things were before and when we were we felt secure uh, when that's not possible the arc of history always is leaning forward and we have to move through these things and it involves change but change is upsetting which anyway all of this opens the door for people to be uh, receptive to these kind of um, 
you can call them conspiracies, but just taking a different lens on it to, to try and um, uh, find a way through it, to find some kind of um, sense of understanding and the calm that comes with understanding. I, Amy was saying the same thing, but, and it, but again, as Craig said, this has happened before. What's different though, this time, well, I can't tell you. If each of you send me seventeen hundred dollars, <laughs> I will give all of you an answer to what's really going on here. Yeah. And it's your turn. No, it's been great. It's, it's, Jen's uh, willing to send it to you for fifteen hundred. Yes, the fifteen hundred. It's in the mail. I, I. But what's going through my mind is it just their mindsets, and probably Dan could could speak to this better than. Well, I know everybody could, but um, there are people that have a utopian conception of of their reality. They think that uh, they live in a in a, the Truman Show, and and everything's everything's going to go great for them. And uh, when things don't go great for them, they think there's a conspiracy afoot. There are other people that live in a that don't live in Southern California who think that there's uh, more contingency in life, and that's just the way life is. And, and uh, that's what religion is for, is to deal with the contingencies of life, um, not to uh, explain the departures from this utopian vision they have. So I'm going to take off of what Ken said and flip the direction of our conversation just a little bit. Both Ken and Gary and Craig and Amy and Scott, all, all of you have kind of hinted at this is a way in which we deal with the situation that we find ourselves in as a nation, as a, a global world, and even individually. So if you look at a more liberal side or a progressive side of Christianity, why isn't that as dominant in helping people through life as the more fundamental um, and some of these offshoots like QAnon. I mean, QAnon, are you ready for this? They've got almost 40 people who are somehow avowing it that are in the federal government as far as in the House or the Senate. I mean, that's just at the federal level. And, you know, you don't see that. So what is it about progressive Christianity and liberal Christianity that isn't, people aren't finding an answer there. It's like, oh, it's not working for me. So I'll, I'll find one of these other things. Amy and then Dan. Um, I was going to say earlier that I had a conversation with my brother-in-law where <laughs> he said something that, to me was off the wall. I wasn't expecting politically on the other side of the spectrum for me. And I got heated and kind of upset at what he was saying, but it was a back and forth conversation. So it wasn't terrible, but I walked away feeling like, where, where did my faith go in that conversation? <laughs> like, I, I didn't express any of what really matters to me. I just got wrapped up in like what's true like where are the facts and trying to convince someone else of the facts and um or just trying to relay the facts even and and i think he felt like he was trying to put forth his own sense of reality and facts and um and i think that's kind of where there's a divergence in belief systems or in in the way that we behave as Christians, but also across religions. There's a mystical side and then there's a literal side. And and towards the mystical side is where Jesus really, you know, what the the historical accounts of Jesus show he was a mystic. You know, he spoke in parables. And and those things that he that he um, taught, the the principles, the beatitudes. <laughs> Um, are found in other places and other religions too and they're what help us through life and give us meaning um, in perhaps a more progressive worldview or, or 
a contingency worldview, however you want to put it. And, and the part of us that is more fearful can be more attracted to finding out the facts and taking things literally and, and figuring out what's really true so that I can live there in a, in a safe, known environment. And I think those two things are in conflict with each other and can lead us in one direction or another, depending on, on where we choose to practice um, our lives. Dan. Dan and then Craig. Well, these, these things always give, give me so many thoughts running through it in my mind at the same time. It's really difficult, guys. But, um, you know, um, I think Craig is correct. I think Ken's correct. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> Gary's on it, Scott's on it. Some, there, there's things going on here, but I'm going to try to just simplify it a little bit. I, I can't remember the biblical reference to this, but when Jesus was um, saying, if, I can't remember it, but it, the disciples were saying, Master, you know what, you won't know what to do if you're gone or something like that. I can't remember what it is. It's in my head. But he said, you've seen me talk and you've seen me do. Just do as I do. And um, that has always stuck in my head in terms of what are, what are the values that I learned out of that. Now let's go back to today. And Craig it says people are fearful today. People are fearful today. And that's true. So they want to have answers. And uh, Craig, I mean, and, and, and Gary said something also. They want to be on the inside. They want to know. I agree with that also. And so when you have fear and you want to know and you don't know what to do, easy, you know, and somebody gives you the answers, you're going to do that. Now I'm going to add another dimension that runs through this in my way of thinking. Our world is different today. It's not as stable as it was when the Bible was written. And it's not as stable as when we had, you know, Galatians and Ephesians. And it's not as stable. So we have a dimension of power and control and, and, and um, um, uh, money and everything else running through this thing now. And so what's happened now with QAnon, it's got the winning thing. It's got the answer thing built into it. It's got power because it's tied up with, with political power today. It's got tied up with world political power today. And so we have a much broader, um, uh, um, uh, which I say, uh, a much broader or a more complicated web to untie here uh, in terms of understanding it. And there are a lot of people don't take the time to understand and to try to pull these pieces apart. They just want the answer. They want the fear to go away. They want to win. They want to be in the inside area. A lot of uh, progressive Christians don't tolerate that stuff. And, and, and the other thing, well, here, the other dimension that's running this through, and it was part of the service this morning and Ellie's meditation and, 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 the, and the, um, the, um, uh, the Abraham um, discussion is that it requires a great deal of self-strength and a great, great deal of self-knowledge and a great deal of knowing what's who you are at this stage in your life to be able to process all this stuff. Uh, people that can't answer the question about yourself, and Ellie referred to that, you've got to love yourself, you referred to it. It's difficult to go out, it's, it's difficult to risk, to have courage. Abraham had to have courage. So I think these are all convoluted stuff that we're all dealing with today, and it's very difficult to, to pull it all apart. And so the heck with it, I got a lot more to do. Just give me the answers. Oh, that's what you guys do to me. <laughs> Craig. Uh, first of all, I do want to point out that, that Jesus pretty much always explained his parables to his disciples. I mean, what's the point of a parable that nobody understands it? So they weren't just left in the air. And, and so, and the second thing, I, I, we have an awful lot of people who are unemployed in this country with a lot of time on their hands that uh, have time to read up on these conspiracies you know, and as you know, I, I work in a hospital, and I'm telling you, if you ever spend time in a COVID unit in ICU, uh, they're very focused, and it's not like conspiracy theories. <laughs> they don't have time to go out and look at all this stuff when we're busy uh, with our, our, our careers. I think once unemployment gets back up, a lot of this will disappear as well. But also with con conspiracy theories and all of this, I always ask, who does it benefit and who's the scapegoat? Okay, and in this case, it seems to be benefiting Trump. And, and who's the scapegoat? 
uh, somebody who's been in Washington for over 40 years, Biden. And that's not a coincidence. And so I'm sure there's a lot in the administration that are getting behind this QAnon and, and encouraging it. So sometimes it's very practical. There's no mysticism out there. There's just, they want to win the election. Hello. Um, Joan. Or Tony, along that line. Ho hold on real quick, Dan. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to get Joan and then tap right into you. I didn't see that. Sorry. I just, uh, nobody has mentioned it. I'm just wondering what is the point of uh, blaming uh, the others in the case of QAnon to uh, that they're uh, sexually immoral and irrational and uh, illegal and what what why is the sex factor in there is that just the worst worst thing they could say about us I, I think I think you tapped into that is very much I mean if you think about the in crime one of the the crimes that are probably seen as being I mean, if you go out and murder someone, I mean, this 17-year-old this kid, right? There's a Christian organization. Um, it's kind of like um, uh, GoFundMe, but it's actually for Christians. They have raised over $200,000 for this young man's defense. $200,000 already. So he went out and murdered someone. Now, if he had been a pedophile, there's no way they're going to raise that money. So I think if you look at it, it's the children represent our future. The children represent innocence. Um, they are to be protected by society. And here, the almost dis most despicable thing a human being can do, and that's this group, and that's what they're doing. So I think it's a great way to demonize and um, de uh, almost dehumanize these individuals by making them into monsters. And that's what... Uh, yeah. if I mean, if you look at what people call pedophiles, monsters, it's, it's, they're no longer human beings. We dehumanize them. So that's why, to me, I, I think. Um, Dan and then Scott. You're just, muted, Dan. Just real quick. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, I don't know how many of you caught this or not, but we watched the whole Republican convention. They introduced, at the end, one of the invited guests was one of the people that are currently leading the, the um, and his wife, he and his, his wife and his, he and his wife as invited guests, he is one of the people who is now doing the QAnon organizing that's not Q, but the one that's doing the kind of stuff that you're talking about, uh, Tony. So I just think that to answer those other questions about maybe that um, Craig will touch on again, there are some, there are some real active kind of things going on here and they're wrapped up in political and as you've been, uh, as we just said, and, and um, winning the election. Yeah, I mean, the, I, the, the Republican um, in Georgia who just won her primary, she was supposed to speak at the Republican convention and they kicked her off at the last moment because of a, a tweet that she did. But otherwise, and she's a huge supporter of QAnon publicly supports it um, and a follower. Scott. Yeah, one of the things I think that like QAnon has in common with a certain part of like evangelical Christianity is this feeling embattled. And I think one of the reasons why a lot of evangelicals have liked Trump is that, you know, if you are um, conservative, you, you do, I mean, the facts on the ground are liberals do control educational institutions by and large, because that's what they go into, right? They do, liberals do have a, a, a huge influence in media um, and things like that, just because that's what they choose to go into, right? And so I think that one of the things that they like about Trump is he doesn't just pay lip service like some presidents have. He'll speak at the pro-life pro rally. He'll go after um, like the media and, and certain elite institutions. And if you look at who the QAnon people theorize, it's all people that are in what they perceive as the media elite circles, right? The, the kind of, it's Hillary Clinton, it's Tom Hanks, it's Oprah. And so I think one of the reasons why evangelicals might find an affinity with it is this, is this kind of feeling like, oh my gosh, these major institutions are controlled or, or, at least, or at least have more influence 
um, behind them by the left, right? And that's just a fact on the ground. Like, you know, the, the, so I think that the QAnon thing, it's interesting because it's always these, it's always the people on that. There's never somebody on the cultural right that's involved in this, right? There's never some prominent like right-wing actor or someone that's also drinking the baby's blood or something. It's just only liberals like to drink baby's blood or something like that. It's a very interesting kind of phenomenon. I, I want to, I still, I want to veer back into a direction I tried to get us to go, but I really want us to go again. What do we as, I, I, and I hate that, I, I'm so frustrated with labels, but I don't know how to talk without them. I mean, that's my challenge. How do you talk about things without labels? Um, you have to identify. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to offer at Beatitudes an alternative Christianity. So what do we have to offer in the current setting where QAnon is flourishing? It is starting. I mean, I'm sorry, but I listened to that guy um, that talked, these YouTubes, a thousand, over a thousand views. I, I've listened to many more progressive Christians, uh, ministers who I think speak far better, more coherent. What is it about a progressive liberal Christianity that is not resonating with people. What is it that we are, are missing? Um, Cause we keep saying that we offer an alternative Christianity that can make life better. It can empower you. It can give you this. And it's not, it doesn't appear to be as receptive as some of these fringe groups. And it's easy to point the finger at them I want us to think about what is it with us that that we need to think about. So Nancy, uh, I'm sorry, Dan, and then Karen. Okay, um, sermon, Tony, this morning was very much along that line uh, with Abraham. You you mentioned will will you know will we let, learn the lessons of Abraham? Judge not, so you will not be judged. Okay. Make love real. I remember, you know, um, Janelle talked about making love real, and you know, and and I've mentioned on numerous occasions. I don't think we're as progressive Christians as good as we could be in terms of talking about what the good life is. Making love real. We're doing a much. You are making a much doing, in my opinion, humble opinion, a much better job than I am doing. But it's like. How do we make love real? What are the behaviors that are associated with that? I th and, and I think that if we do that very, very well, if it's done very, very well, we'll get some of the people who are trying to find answers because the answers in terms of making love real are a lot more safer than it is to have guns and, and, and fires controlling people. But it takes a lot of people saying the same message just as we've seen marketing people in our conventions it takes a lot of people saying the same thing over and over in terms of what is life like or uh, if you believe in making love real what is life like what is life like if you try to uh, follow what was in the message of Abraham what is that about, about like and I and, and when when the disciples asked you know what are we supposed to do without you they haven't been observing what making life good is what Jesus said you saw what I did. Do as I do. So that's a tough. That's a tough message. If somebody gives you the answers, you can. Yeah, let's go. We're all going to get in this together. If you don't get good answers, and nobody, nobody. Oh, what did you do? I don't know what I'm. Yeah, I got to figure it out myself. Yeah. And the <laughs> only thing that's stronger than hate is love, and love is the way to to go. So we're going to go, Karen, and then Tom. Well, I mean, judgment. And that's what Dan was talking about as well. Um, I want to toot Beatitudes. And I'm so glad that you're recording this one. Because I think this group on this Zoom is very unique. Because I haven't heard anybody badmouth the more conservative side. I think that what the attitudes has to offer is number one we're able to have this conversation and these aren't 
this is not an easy subject to talk about and not spur up some feelings of, of negative common sense um, on people who buy into the QAnon. So I'm so glad that this is being recorded because this group really depicts what the attitude is about. We can talk about these tough issues, but we don't have to bash other people. Thank you. Tom. Well, uh, maybe I am going to bad mouth. Uh, <laughs> one of the first things, uh, if we look at these people, uh, well, just in general, the, the education level, is probably just a little cut below. And uh, secondly, uh, it seems to me that the QAnon people are similar to the uh, people who believe in extraterrestrials. Uh, you know that the extraterrestrials built the pyramids and the people who find Bigfoot in the forest. And they all almost have proof, except the camera was a little out of focus or they lost the, uh, negatives or, you know, the, the, the proof is on the edge, but they don't quite have it. They're, it seems to me they're the same people. And, and I think that, uh, Amy. Um, I was actually thinking that about your question about why progressivism isn't more appealing. Um, why maybe QAnon seems to be more appealing on Facebook, and I'm not sure that that's a good indication of what's more appealing, but um, generally speaking, it's not asking people to forsake a well-established institution like Christianity. It's actually using it to kind of take it in a, in a more negative direction if, if, you're, if you're not a QAnon believer. Um, but it's, it's not asking you to reject where you came from in any way or an institution that's been around for a long time. And um, alternatively, progressive Christianity or maybe, I don't know, it's maybe daring to say, but just following Christ by doing, <laughs> I'm not sure that you can equate progressive Christianity with that. I think it's just Christianity. But doing what Christ did and loving others first um, and loving yourself and loving God. Those are like, those are radical things to do and they don't really go along with Christianity in America as it is today. And so it's really kind of asking you to reject perhaps what's been established and, and become a norm. And that's why it's a tougher sell, I think, because it caught it, it is calling forth a change within. And that's always going to be a road up. But it's also a, a positive direction to go. Like, I don't want to be anywhere else but that. I don't want to go anywhere else but up. And, and so I think it's worth continuing to, to speak for no reason other than like, I don't want to, I don't want to go anywhere else but to be speaking that. You know, one of the things that I, and thank you for that, Amy. Um, one of the things that hit me when in listening to this discussion is it's almost as if right now a lot of what has taken place since the Enlightenment has actually um, gone backwards and that we are relying more on our gut and this sense of what we see as right or wrong rather than still looking at empirical evidence. I think one of the challenges for progressive Christianity is how do we talk about the mystery of life and yet still balance that off with the intellect? How, how do we balance those in our lives? 
because I, I, I do hear a lot of Christians say, well, it just you have to accept it by faith. But what I hear them accepting by faith is a proposition. What about the, how do we talk about mystery as not being propositional? And then how do we, how do we keep those in balance between our intellect and what we see things, and then at the same time, allowing for this, just the mystery of life, or you can call it the mystery of God, and just relishing in those. Does that, do you see what I'm trying to, to ask there? Dan. Okay, Tony. I, I, yeah, the, the, that's a question I've struggled with for a long time. Um, I think it depends upon a couple of things. Trust is the first one. Trust that you're doing the best you can do to understand the mystery of life. Trust in the fact that the path that you're following, because you were taught these things as the best way to move, to live through life, to follow Jesus or to, you know, to follow the, what the lessons of God were, is you have to trust in that and you trust in the mystery of that. If you do that, the outcomes are going to be okay. If I, if I, and I had, I had to come to that conclusion because I could be all over the map. I once liked Zoroaster very, very much. And, you know, I just, it just, it, but I couldn't go there either. And so what you have to do is finally come to the point in which you trust that the mystery that is, that, you, you, that is out there and that you try to define by empirical evidence, by see if the stuff that you rely upon works, you can build your trust. But you got to start with trust and you got to work hard at what you trust. You can't just trust something and then let somebody else tell you what to do. It doesn't work that way. I, for yeah. at least it doesn't for me. Yeah. Um, that, Scott? That, that's my thing. Scott and then Janelle. I just want to say, I think there's like lots of examples of people Today, I mean, I can think of a bunch of uh, uh, fans, John Polkinghorne, who is an award-winning the theoretical physicist from England. I remember hearing him at Princeton Seminary defending the virgin birth. I mean, I didn't expect him to do that. He's a kind of liberal, he's a progressive kind of Anglican Christian. Um, or Pope Francis, who is a chemical engineer. Uh, or Francis Collins, who is head of the genome mapping. And I think he's head of the National Institute of Health or something. And he's been one of the people that's at the at the forefront of the COVID battle, and I know, like I've heard him interviewed, he believes in the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection. So I mean, I think there are people that wind up immersed in science and critical thinking in modernity, and also have a dialogue with that in light of the mysteries of traditional faith. And I think that's a vibrant. I mean, I think there's a. I'm not saying it's the only way to be Christian either. I mean. Some people reject certain mysteries and, and stay in the faith, but I'm saying it doesn't, I think there are a lot of people that actually wind up with a very vibrant and fervent interaction between these mysteries and the best of late modern scientific and critical thinking. Yeah. Um, we've gone over 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to go another five or 10. So if you need to uh, bug out, I very much respect that. Uh, but there is a question that I do have. Um, I had a therapist ask me about how Christians, some Christians view meditation. And she said she had heard that some Christians see meditation as a, uh, as sinful because you are clearing your mind, you're opening your mind. Uh, making it blank, and you're allowing room then for the devil to come in and put thoughts into your mind and things like that. It, it, however, it does, it made me stop and think about how do we as Christians, especially progressive Christians, how do we keep the intellect but through other spiritual exercises, allow for the mystery to exist. And, and, and tap into that, that, that sense of awe, that sense of, of not knowing. And I'm wondering if, you know, it seems, again, this is just my diatribe, but it seems like as, as progressives, we're really good at thinking, 
and doing. We love to talk about knowledge, and then we love to do, which is social justice stuff. But when it comes to that other side, that's what I'm... So before anyone answers that, I've got Janelle uh, that I, I need to get to. Well, you're taking it in a different direction now. So. No, but before we go that, bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> well, traditionally, isn't it, um, at least for the Lutherans and the Catholics, it's always been the order of faith is, here's what you need to believe, this is what you got to do, and now you belong. That order. And so I was just going to say, I'm, I'm feeling like progressive Christianity is like reversing that order. You belong. So let's do this together. And then wow. what we believe, right? Wow. That I, I for some reason, um, man, that's, I've never heard that. That is really powerful. I mean, it, it is very much about belonging. And then if you belong, then let's be let's together. Do something. Let's, yeah, and then out of that will come a determination of what it is you believe. Of what our doctrine is. Wow, that was good. I'm not taking credit for that. That's Diana Butler Bass. I've been reading a lot about her. <laughs> and that's from Christianity After Religion. That's good. That's really good. Uh, Ellie. Um, you're, you're muted. But it's been fun watching your lips move without Thank you. sound. Thank you. I just want to marinate in that. I think I'll pass and okay. you can pose your question again, but I think, I think that that's an important thing that Janelle added. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think it's a good place to end personally. Um, I, I, <laughs> You're such a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. I mean, that's. You do that all the time. Yeah. I, you know, I are... think, again, I, I think the key to the future of progressive Christianity is, is going back to what a, a lot of you have hinted at, and that's us as individuals. I mean, the only people that we can change in this world is ourselves. We can have a powerful influence on other people. And I think being a part of a community like this can empower us to really go out and and through our lives, through our words, through our actions, we can demonstrate w what it means to be fully human. And I, 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 I'm going to talk, you know, Jesus to me, if, 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 you're, if you want to leave all the divinity and all that stuff on there, that's fine. But uh, for those who don't put that on there, I still think you're tapping into a person who really was able to live life in a way that attracted other people. And they saw in, in him what they might be able to find within themselves. And to me, that's Christianity. That's what it's all about. So, okay. Um, as far as what's coming up, the uh, first of all, a big, uh, just appreciation to Church of the Beatitudes. I am so fortunate to be the minister here. I I have never preached a sermon on an Apocrypha book, and that's what I was able to do this Sunday, uh, the Testament of Abraham. I've never preached one for it. And it, to be at a church where I have that freedom is huge. So thank you uh, for those of you who are members of the Church of Beatitudes. And also, again, a huge thank you to our staff. If you have not seen this worship, at least watch the first five minutes. Because what you're going to get is a behind-the-scene look at our recording and what actually goes on to put it together. And Ryan and Janelle and Ellie and Andrea, a huge, I mean, they're the ones that are making this happen for us. So a huge thank you to them. Um, the other thing is this coming Wednesday, we'll, we have our Beatitudes Boost. And there's the new podcast that's come out. It's called Between the Lines. And... That is opportunity to look at religion from a spirit, how it impacts um, culture and society. And then last of all, um, if you know of anyone that you would like to um, invite to be a part of this, please feel free. Because ultimately, the way that this grows um, is because of people you invited. I mean, Scott is here because Ellie invited him. 
and um, at least oh, to blame. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And then the other one too is this Wednesday. If you join us for Beatitudes Boost, please make macaroni and cheese because we are all eating together mac and cheese, and there is an award for the winner that has the most um, creative. creative way creative. of mac and cheese. So, Do you have the rubric for that? Um, yes, <laughs> but I can't share it. It's a, it's a secret. Wait, <laughs> wait for the drop. The drop QAnon. is coming. It's, it's QAnon. Like yeah. <laughs> the, the drop it's is... conspiracy theory. Yeah. Over the next couple of days, watch for a drop um, that will give you the, the rubric. <laughs> From Amazon. Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for your time. Have a great day and stay safe out there.